We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I strongly believe that without proper measurement and modeling, analysis of public policy issues comes down to people's individual opinions. And however smart and well-informed they are, I'm just not sure that that's uh, the way forward. And that, that's one, one reason why I felt really strongly about creating the online and interactive uh, going digital toolkit back in 2019. Uh, it includes a core set of indicators uh, that maps uh, that really helps countries assess uh, their state of digital development and data exploration and visualization are really key features of this toolkit and policy advice is also available on the toolkit to help countries improve their performance. So if you want to go check it out here while I'm talking, I'd be super happy if you did that. Uh, it's www.oecd.org slash going hyphen digital dot hyphen toolkit. Or you can just Google uh, OECD Going Digital Toolkit and it'll, it'll pop up. And really take a minute to, to explore some of the indicators uh, as well as some of the, the policy advice that's there. Now, really importantly, the, the toolkit is structured along the lines of the OECD Going Digital Integrated Policy Framework, really with the aim of what we're talking about today, to make digital transformation work, not just for growth, that's important, but also for well-being. And I want to highlight this isn't something that, you know, I came up with on my own or a couple people came up with at the OECD. It took two and a half years to develop uh, with people from every policy community represented at the OECD. And for those of you that don't know us, that really includes everybody apart from national defense. So this is a really um, validated, a really well-researched framework. And we use it um, to map indicators along seven different dimensions. And these dimensions include access uh, to data, communications, infrastructure, and services. We saw in the chat that access to affordable broadband is something that's really important. Effective use of digital technologies and data by people, firms, and governments. This is really the idea that we have all these technologies, but people may not uh, be using them effectively. They may not have the skills, which is something we also uh, saw in the chat. Innovation, which really pushes out the frontier of what's possible in the digital age. And this is something that's important in driving job creation, productivity, uh, and sustainable growth. And digital sectors are, we've shown, to be very innovative. Jobs, uh, which highlights that as labor markets evolve, and they will, that's normal, uh, we must ensure that digital trans transformation leads to more and better jobs and that we facilitate just transitions from one job to the next. So we need to be able to, um, to, to skill our kids, to give them the tools they need, the skills they need to succeed. But we also need to help adults uh, who are already in the labor market uh, transition uh, with new skills and prospects. Society is, a, is the fifth dimension, with, which reflects the fact that digital technologies affect society in complex and interrelated ways, and that all stakeholders uh, must work together to balance the risks and benefits. Digital technologies are in and of themselves neutral, uh, but they do have risks and benefits, and we need to find a way uh, to balance those for people and for society as a whole. Trust in digital environments is the sixth policy dimension because without trust, nobody will use digital technologies. I often have colleagues who, who talk you know, about how important infrastructure is and they're absolutely right, but it's also the case that if people don't trust technology, if they don't trust that their data is gonna be protected, if they don't trust that they can buy and interact online, people aren't gonna use these tools. And a really important source of productivity growth is going to be left uh, unexploited. And then the last dimension is market openness. And this is really the enabling environment for the digital transformation to flourish. It's about competition policy, uh, trade policy, tax policy, uh, all things that have a very important digital dimension. 
Now, throughout the framework, we really um, insist on the fact that these dimensions need to be considered jointly. They need to be coordinated within government uh, in a very effective way, and they need to be measured uh, to, to, to really help countries see where, where they stand. Um, we also have cross-cutting themes on the toolkit that run, run through these dimensions, including on gender, as well as development. Uh, we did uh, a project in the last round of improvements to map the indicators to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we, we also have a theme on well-being more broadly. So please do take a moment to, to check out uh, the toolkit. Now, all this said, I feel like we've made an immense amount uh, of progress, but at the same time, measuring digital transformation is in many cases still uncharted territory. It's really, really tough. An important part of this uh, workshop for me anyway, is to brainstorm together the ways we're gonna enrich the indicators on the toolkit going forward. In particular, I think with respect to, to trust, especially in the areas of privacy and security, as well as uh, societal inclusion. And here for me, thinking about mis and disinformation, as well, there, as well as other types of untruths online um, is really important because it, it really is a huge, huge issue we're just beginning to scratch the surface of and that we've seen can cause an immense amount of social instability. Um, so without further ado, that was a little bit of an intro for me on the toolkit. It's a free resource. Please, uh, please check it out and tell me how we can make it better. It will always be a work in progress. Uh, but I'd really like to, to warmly welcome Dominic Rosecrid, the president of Statistics Poland, uh, to give us some keynote remarks on Poland's efforts to measure the inclusive aspects of digital transformation, as well as his views on one or two related areas in which he thinks the OECD should focus uh, to enrich the toolkit going forward. So Dominic, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Molly. It's a, it's, a, it's a honor for me to be here today. Uh, of course, uh, it's a pity that we cannot see each other, you know, in person, you know, uh, and no matter what we think about those digital tools that allowed us to have those meetings nowadays, these ways, you know, they will never uh, be better than just a real thing. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's for sure. So no matter how we progress in terms of ICTs, you know, we always need these uh, direct interactions. So uh, let's start with wishing ourselves that we can, we can come back to, uh, to what we had before. And uh, I'll try to be very brief first, uh, a little bit about the, uh, <clears throat> the measuring of, uh, you know, digital transformation, let's call it this way, uh, in Poland. Of course, we've been a, a part of the European statistical system for a long time already, starting in 2004. And uh, thus, we also, con you know, convey the same uh, surveys, mostly, which are harmonized at the European level. Uh, but these are also discussed extensively at the ages of the OECD. I remember very well being a part of the a uh, group that Mark is chairing uh, was always uh, fantastic to be there on the meetings and discuss these issues because we uh, really discussed uh, things that went there uh, into uh, surveys both in uh, outside Europe and inside Europe and, and we've been doing these ICT surveys for many years already and uh, uh, they, they proved to be very useful. The same with the ITU meetings and the, at the UN premises in Geneva when, when I had a chance to, 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 to meet Alex Alexander always, you know, uh, we've been discussing these issues as well. Uh, so uh, let's be be uh, direct and, and disregard the ICT surveys, you know, both in households and in enterprises to, uh, to be a very useful tool. I, I, I did advantage of those, you know, on a daily basis, uh, uh, very often, both being a statistician responsible for producing these numbers, but also using the numbers and planning a thing like a census, which I'm going to come back to in a moment. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's not all the thing, that's not the complete picture of what we're doing here at the uh, Statistics Poland. Um, uh, we also have something that is less commonly known, but that also provides us with some interesting measurements, uh, which is called social cohesion survey. And this is outside of the uh, sphere of harmonization within the European statistical system. This is our own national survey. It's very wide in terms of uh, topics covered, and it, and it covers things like well-being mostly. 
and uh, but also trust, uh, but also uh, ICT usage at the level of the individuals and households as well, uh, though through a different perspective than uh, the ICT survey. And we're very proud of this. Uh, it happens every few years, like four or five years, but uh, it's very extensive and it's uh, one of the very few examples, I guess, if not the only one uh, uh, at the global level, and uh, in which we are trying to come up with subjective well-being measures. So that's that's really uh, useful because you know, of course, when you have some way of measuring some important area of of uh, of uh, of living, you know, and then you can break it down to uh, I know ICT breakdowns, ICT related breakdowns, all these things that we're interested in this in this uh, realm here that, that really enriches your, your understanding of what the problems might be uh, within the society and how to, how to address them. Uh, of course, you know, indirectly, this happens also, I mean, this measuring of uh, digital transformation through other tools like household budget survey, you know, asks questions of how much do you spend online, you know? So for example, you know, linking this data with the, with the, with the other side, with the ICT survey is always interesting and, uh, and it enriched our understanding of many uh, uh, issues. Uh, I, I would like to tell you about my experience because I'm a, I call myself for, for the last two months a census survivor because we did a census and we did it during the pandemic and we did a very hard decision to make it through in the pandemic, not to postpone it to the next year or to in two years because well now I, I fully uh, uh, believe that you know. Uh, uh, if, if not during the pandemic, then when do we need such a detailed data about our society, then not during the pandemic. And, uh, and that's why we decided to do it. Of course, it, it, it was connected with a lot of issues, uh, organizational issues. And of course, uh, one of the challenges was how to do it in an online form so that we uh, limit the interactions in between the interviewers and the respondents. And uh, we are not one of those Scandinavian countries that does everything with a click of a button taking uh, advantage of administrative sources. We cannot do that. So we do the mixed method. And um, <clears throat> of course, uh, I told you about the ICT survey. My point of uh, uh, start was uh, to analyze ICT data and to do some kind of like a simple modeling based on those data in order to come up with a prediction of the percentage of the society that would participate online that was extremely important at the beginning because we have very strict financial planning uh, procedures and uh, we have taken advantage at least me myself i took a clue of how can we uh, what can we expect we i came up with a number about 40 percent you know which is not kind of like a, a groundbreaking i would say but uh, uh, when when you know uh, a little bit more about our society you you would know that it's a lot already <laughs> that's a lot already so you know, we face a lot of challenges still in terms of the ict skills and uh, and and all these issues and um, uh, but uh, I can tell you, there's no better survey than the census. <laughs> I mean, because it's not a survey, and we did it, and it turned out that 55% of of people, you know, participated online, and uh, and but it uh, also led me to some uh, interesting uh, remarks and conclusions on how how to shape, for example, policies ad addressing the issue of. ICT or um, digital exclusion, you know, it, it's not that we were kind of like reactive, we offered something and we were waiting passively for people to come because that would never work, we would, we would get like 10%. Uh, what we did, we were very proactive in terms of the communication, but only this, we have, we've been kind of like re physically reaching out to people, trying to help them to connect, to, to do the census online, even if it meant sometimes for us more effort that we've been just uh, you know, investing through a regular telephone interview, but we we took this uh, uh, opportunity to try to as hard as as possible to to convince people to using those new forms of participation in a in a you know public living and a social living. So that was very uh, telling to me, and uh, it gives me a lot of clues in terms of how policy making in terms of addressing these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, exclusion issues should 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 go. So uh, in regard to the OECD toolkit, I, I like it very much. I, I like those seven areas, uh, especially innovation is my 
<laughs> is my favorite one. And, and it's a very good tool, of course, as always, uh, whatever comes from the OECD, I always praise that, you know, so I, I'm maybe biased a little bit, but, it, but it's a really good tool. It's really informative and it, it, you can, uh, you know, it's visualized, visualized in a way that you don't spend time guessing what, what the thing is. You just write that right away, know what, what, what it should be. And, uh, and you can take advantage of, you know, making comparisons between your country and the other countries. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the thing is, um, with, as with everything that uh, our society, uh, our reality is progressing, you know, everything is changing and the new challenges are coming as well. And um, it, it, things keep evolving, uh, 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 especially at the political level, uh, the level of political initiatives. So I can give you an example of the European policies in this regard. We had an EU data strategy. We have a GDPR, which is related to privacy. We had an open data directive. Uh, part of that is nowadays also the initiative to, to introduce something that is called high value data sets. Uh, there are new two regulations coming, EU Data Act and EU Data Governance Act, uh, which are to uh, establish something that is called EU Data Spaces. And those data spaces are the kind of like political initiative to, to, to facilitate the exchange of data at the, at the, at the level of speed and uh, an openness never, never uh, faced by, uh, within our societies in order to, of course, uh, support some innovation and so on and so forth. But I can tell you, those innovative, those innovative initiatives that are at a very high level of abstraction. And of course, those need also some kind of measurement frameworks in order to uh, assess their successfulness. But at the end of the day, you know, those are addressing the, the, the needs of society, I would say. And, then, and at the end of the day, you know, of course, it comes back to the very single you know, uh, part as uh, individual, you know, part of a society. And uh, uh, we, we need some, some ways of measuring those, but I, I will tell you uh, that they won't be successful until we also pair them with some uh, measuring of, uh, of what is the progress at the individual level and, uh, and introduce some policies in parallel that will invest into the capacity of the individual people uh, in terms of like building the frameworks, you know, skills frameworks for some dedicated areas like in the financial sector or other sectors. You know, there are so many of those areas. The digital skills are actually different, even though we can call them digital skills, they, they must be uh, completely different. So, you know, when the devil is in the de details, as they always say. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done, you know, going into those details and just exploring the new possibilities. And uh, also, uh, technically, from the point of view of those who are responsible for measurement, like uh, office, uh, official statistical uh, 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 official statistics, uh, the, 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 the very important issue now at the moment is access to new data sources, including especially uh, to privately held data, which will allow us to, to go uh, more in depth in the measurement systems. And uh, this is the issue that we are working, working very uh, uh, hardly here in the European Union. I mean, in terms of introducing some, some legislation that will allow us to, to access those privately held data uh, sources. So, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if I would be to conclude my, my short intervention, uh, I would think that those very high level initiatives are extremely important because they put us uh, on another level of development in terms of digitalization. But at the end of the day, we need to also not to forget about the, uh, those who are still excluded, those who are living in the rural areas, who, who are, uh, as I say, far from the road and whatever, uh, whatever you know, realm, whatever, whatever meaning of this, and, uh, and because there is still a huge potential uh, in the people in our societies, with the, which is being uh, not used uh, because uh, we face this issue of exclusion. So, so um, it's important to go, do both: go from bottom, bottom down, but uh, top, top to down, and, and bottom up as well uh, in, in this area. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot, Dominic. Uh, that was that was really interesting. I'd never thought about getting insights from from the census. Uh, so this is something definitely I'm really excited to to explore. You know, you mentioned that that idea of digital skills, and I, I agree with you. That's amazingly important. It's probably the biggest area I see uh, we need to work on, at least across OECD members. Uh, but not just on what, what I think of as digital skills, which would be ICT skills, but also foundational skills, right? Reading, writing, arithmetic has been 
been shown to be really important as well as, well as those soft skills, the people skills, the problem solving skills. Uh, those have all, all come to the fore as being really needed, even, in, you know, especially even more now in this highly um, digital society. Um, I, I, it's also interesting to hear you mention the um, government access to private sector data and the fact that the EU is working on that. We're also working on some principles to try to guide that at the OECD, um, but it is a really, really hard politically sensitive issue uh, that, that's still kind of being, um, being looked at uh, by members. So I've talked a lot and I have other questions, but I'd be happy if, if other people would, would like to ask Dominic uh, something either by raising their hand and identifying themselves or uh, in the chat. I don't want it to be just a, a passive session. We're in a, in a brainstorming session doing it the best we can uh, virtually. So if there are any comments or questions uh, to Dominic, please, please raise them. Uh, and maybe, maybe when, when, you know, while we're waiting for that, one thing I, I sort of wanted to, to ask you about, you mentioned uh, you're part of some of these international bodies like the European Statistical System Committee, the UN Statistical Commission. At the OECD, we have what's called the the Going Digital Measurement Roadmap, which was an important output um, of a big horizontal project uh, we had. And the idea with that was that we would get all of the policy communities at the OECD, which are very different, to agree on uh, nine core actions that everybody was going to try to push forward on the measurement agenda. And I, I view that as, as a big achievement because otherwise, at least uh, in our context, every committee was doing their little thing, but it wasn't joined up in a good way. Uh, and I was wondering from, from your perspective, being part of these international bodies, do you see any moves toward um, joining forces with other countries on this inclusive or well-being digital measurement agenda? Uh, and if yes, what, what direction do you see it, it taking? Yeah, and, uh, that's a very interesting question. I know my, my very brief, um, uh, uh, opinion about that is that we, we, we have a lot of international cooperation in, in the regard of, uh, you know, just let's start with the access to privately held data. I've been kind of like chairing one of the task teams within the European statistical system, but we have a, a, a parallel team like that uh, on, on the DIGs of the United Nations Statistical Commission in, in New York as, as well in the, in the UNECE in Geneva as well, working on this issue. So uh, the other important topic that we are currently exploring like heavily is the issue of data stewardship which is something that uh, really uh, comes to uh, uh, to a situation now as an important uh, factor because you know uh, if we see those uh, you know data ecosystem growing so rapidly then that we need some kind of like a uh, people in, in the middle in the middle that would uh, catalyze the exchange of data you know to facilitate the exchange of data know exactly what the data is about where to find the data you know so we see those new kind of like uh, professions even uh, uh, coming and uh, uh, we also observe that there is no kind of like uh, uh, framework for skills for data stewards within different communities so this is one of the challenges and, uh, and to conclude this I, I, my, my opinion is that we are rushing now into many directions just exploring the these new things, but uh, I, I think that at the end of this period of just exploration and coming up with the new ideas and uh, directions, there will be a lot of work to be done in order to kind of like fill it in with some, with some matter. I would say. So what I think about is like, if we have those European data spaces and we think how to organize them, and we as official statisticians want to put some, some words in the legislation that will within the European data spaces will allow us to access privately held data, that's, that's okay, that's a good direction. But then at the end of the day, we'll also need some measurement measures, indicators that will facilitate to, uh, to monitor the progress of those strategies. And uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled about it. I, I don't see too much of the discussion about the measurement frameworks in, in this new uh, areas, but uh, I think that's coming. And uh, uh, I can tell you that we should fill in our 
agendas for the next two years with those new topics, uh, uh, but taking them more seriously and in depth. Well, thanks so much. We've got one more question from you for you before we, we go to the panel from Fabio Sen from Brazil. Uh, how to ensure international comparability of data in a context where data producers are making use of local strategies and innovative methods. And I don't know, Fabio, if you want to elaborate on that. And yeah, that's uh, that's one. Uh, that's my favorite question because uh, you know. <laughs> Again, within the, we, we, we have a privilege here in the Europe that we have this European statistical system and we have a, like a very well established system of harmonization of our statistics and we work, you know, nowadays virtually, which is not that effective, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we, we work on harmonization of our statistics and we do a lot of progress in this regard and this really facilitates this data comparability, but in terms of international, you know, going on like a more uh, global uh, it's it's a big challenge because uh, we are progressing very quickly uh, independently even though we discuss big ideas are the premises of the United Nations for example uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we come up with those with the same operationalization of those ideas in different regards and I think that you know uh, the more uh, coordination in between the international co uh, organizations the better for all for us all, so I think that international organizations, and I'm, uh, I'm pointing out that the OECD as well should take this kind of responsibility to, to, to facilitate this harmonization process. Well, thanks so much, and I agree that's an important, really important point. And I always get so frustrated when people that that aren't involved in actually collecting, cleaning uh, data ask for breakdowns that we can't provide and why we can't compare this country to that. Uh, but we really have to, to be careful about that and having some way to ensure comparability through model surveys, for example, uh, is really important. So thank you so much uh, for, for your remarks and definitely stay here because you're coming back to you a little bit later. Uh, but with many thanks to you, let's start the panel discussion. And um, first, I'd like to, to invite uh, Nagwa Al Shinanwi, Under Secretary for in Information and Decision Support in the Egyptian Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, to take the floor and give us an overview of Egypt's efforts and future projects to measure the societal impacts of digital transformation, as well as one or two uh, specific and actionable areas in which you want us to see elaborate the toolkit and really, you know, um, definitely give me constructive feedback for the toolkit. I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm not going to feel bad. In fact, I'm, I'm really welcome and I'll welcome and be open to it. So Nagwa, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Molly. And uh, thanks for the IGF for uh, this opportunity. Uh, um, actually, there is a fruitful cooperation and partnership between Egypt and OECD back into several years with the Science, Technology and Innovation Directorate and all its different committees. Um, uh, and uh, based on the digital and the ongoing digital integrated framework developed by OECD, uh, as well as the survey models of the household and the private business and other surveys also, uh, like, for example, the surveys of the ITU in the, for the household and the digital skills. Uh, based on all of this, uh, Egypt um, uh, really uh, succeeded to uh, measure the ICT at large during the last uh, uh, years and made a great effort, uh, especially in measuring the digital transformation, especially in terms of access and use. And uh, really, we succeeded um, uh, to cover uh, uh, important dimension in order to measure the, if uh, our digital transformation are inclusive or not, uh, such as the gender uh, perspective, uh, the rural and urban perspective. All uh, this measure really were uh, helped and supporting our policymaker in measuring the digital transformation implementation of the strategy as well as the, to follow up the policies related to the digital transformation. And uh, they were able to see where the country stayed, uh, especially that actually Egypt started the digital transformation uh, uh, implementation plan back into 
uh, five years ago. So uh, this really, this framework was very useful as well as we followed up with the, uh, the digital, uh, uh, the toolkit uh, developed by uh, the OECD uh, and also the progress made in the toolkit to measure uh, the different area of the digital uh, transformation. Uh, we also uh, were able to provide the, the uh, policymaker uh, uh, with the measurement uh, to see the challenge that still Egypt facing um, in terms of um, uh, reaching uh, accessibility and use of ICT uh, all over the country among the different, the different governorate. Uh, also, we uh, succeeded by this measurement as well to propose sometimes, uh, I, I, I really, I, I, um, I, I was proud to, to tell this, that I contributed in proposing some policies and initiative, uh, for example, related to the gender and uh, how really we can use the ICT in order to empower the gender in our country. Uh, so uh, uh, this is in, in a nutshell, uh, a brief about the progress done in Egypt. But in addition to this, I would like also to mention that since the year 2019, the government of Egypt and the OECD Secretariat have been negotiated, negotiating an Egypt OECD country program. And this is to support the structure uh, reform uh, taking place in, in, in the country. And several consultations uh, were carried at the technical level as well as the political level in order to identify the scope of this program. Uh, um, uh, Actually, uh, Egypt has recently launched the second phase of the national uh, program of the, uh, for social and economic reform. And uh, based on the first phase, uh, we focused in the second phase on three main areas, the manufacturing, the ICT, and the agriculture, in order really to achieve a more diversified productive economy. So the country program uh, already launched uh, successfully in last October, uh, and the agreement was signed in Paris in the OECD headquarters uh, in the presence of His Excellency, uh, the Prime Minister of Egypt, as well as His Excellency, the Secretary General of the OECD. We expect from this country program uh, that the OECD can help us uh, to uh, really uh, in the implementation of the different uh, type of reform that Egypt is looking for. It will also help us to serve as a guidance for the implementation of uh, the recently revised the Sustainable Development Strategy of Egypt and the 2030 Agenda of the country. The program will focus on five pillars, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, Second, innovation and digital transformation, governance and anti-corruption, statistics, and the sustainable uh, development. Uh, concerning MCIT specifically, or the Ministry of Communication, we have uh, uh, two projects, and this is, this is what we are looking for for, uh, for the toolkit. Um, uh, the first one is related to the artificial intelligence. So we are uh, looking for a, uh, some sort of comparative uh, study uh, in the artificial intelligence in order to benefit from the OECD uh, experience, uh, lesson learned, and also to measure uh, where we stand uh, the gaps in Egypt in this uh, important area. The second, uh, uh, which is mainly I, uh, I was responsible to draft this project in cooperation with the MONLI, uh, which related to the unleashing the innovation. Uh, this is also a very important area for Egypt uh, to be measured, uh, especially that uh, uh, the progress right now, it's still uh, uh, not up to the level uh, because I think of different things because uh, uh, it's, it's um, uh, maybe uh, the measurement itself, the tool, the methodology. So we are looking forward from the OCD to benefit in such area and to build the capacity uh, of our country in this area to be able uh, to measure it uh, through this project. This project is expected to be implemented during the upcoming uh, three years, and it will be with the uh, STI uh, uh, directory. 
And finally, I will uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Molly again for her effort to support us in this country program, and especially for me in the project, in the upcoming project for uh, measuring the, the innovation. Thank you very much. So th thanks so much, Nagwa, and it's, it's really neat to thank you. I'm super excited about the project, and whenever we engage with partner countries, I always find I, I end up learning a lot, so I, I'm really look, looking forward to that. Uh, you brought up a lot of important points. I mean, uh, one thing is the fact that we're measuring not for measurement's sake, but we're measuring with the, with the idea that we're trying to implement reforms. And so thinking about that link between the measurement and, and the policy and the reform agendas, uh, I think it is absolutely important. You mentioned also some of the, the digital divides that you were looking at in terms of infrastructure as well as, as gender. Uh, we also see quite some digital divides with respect to, to firm size, at least across the OECD with small firms often, often having a hard time reaping the benefits uh, of digital transformation as much as larger firms, as well as on the skill side. Um, but before, before I, I let other people ask you questions, I'm going to abuse my, my role as moderator and ask you one of my own. I mean, as a senior woman in the Egyptian government, uh, I view you really, in many ways, as a role model for, for young women uh, who want to move into the digital economy field, which is often dominated by men, and not measurement, which I think is, is likewise the same. And I wondered, in Egypt, when you said you, you, you looked into some of the, the, the gender gaps, um, what what came what came out of that mostly? What was the the big takeaway from you from the, the gender data that you collected on digital? I'm just curious if if it follows what we see uh, in OECD countries, which is really it's the skills um, where we see the biggest gender gap rather than, for example, uh, connectivity. Thank you, Molly, for your question. Uh, actually, it's um, uh, the measurement and uh, uh, really uh, following up the situation of the household and the individual accessing to the ICT tools as well as to uh, also use this tool in order to, to benefit uh, from them in, in all aspects of life. Uh, one of, of uh, the criteria and one of the important dimension was to see this among the gender, uh, not only in the capital, but also in the other governorates. Especially this helped uh, me a lot to see uh, the picture um, in the rural governorate and in the remote area, which really we found that uh, uh, in terms of accessibility, the accessibility percentage was low as well as the use uh, as well was low. And from this uh, indicator and measurement, uh, as I mentioned, I really um, uh, uh, developed this, uh, this initiative for the gender, uh, which called the uh, ICT for women and girls in Egypt. And this, uh, this initiative, it, it actually for uh, helping the women and uh, the girls all over the country to access and use the ICT, uh, in the different governorate. And this is through a platform. Uh, there is a platform in order to help them uh, to, to, to build their skills in the ICT to benefit from different uh, ICT skills and tool, which is already offered in collaboration with the uh, other partner, multinationals, other ICT companies in my country. This is from one side. Also, uh, this platform includes all the, uh, the different measurement that we collect among the gender in order to help the policymaker, as I mentioned, to see the situation and to see as well the progress because the policies taken in the digital transformation plan, it should affect as well uh, the women like the men in the same time. Also, this initiative helped us to also to go, but this is before the COVID-19 uh, uh, or, or before the pandemic. We went uh, um, in uh, and held different events all over the governorates in, in my country. Uh, especially, I started by the Upper Egypt and I started by the rural area. 
uh, to reach the women, the, the uh, entrepreneur, the women who own small uh, business, as well as the student in the um, uh, universities uh, in this governorate. And really, um, I uh, succeeded to, to help for them hackathons uh, uh, in order to use the ICT. I succeeded to, to also to help for them um, um, uh, capacity building program in cooperation, as I mentioned, with, uh, with different uh, private sector companies, as well as in cooperation with other partner from international organization. Uh, it was a really successful uh, uh, process and we uh, it helped us a lot because we also we got we got input from them uh, how to sustain this initiative and how also to expand it in the future. And we uh, heard from us uh, from them uh, as well um, uh, the, the benefits uh, and the outcome uh, of this uh, initiative uh, and what they are looking for for the future from this initiative. So this is in a nutshell uh, what uh, what can I say about uh, this initiative and what we already done uh, till right now. Well, congratulations on that. That sounds uh, exciting and a huge amount of progress. So you should feel immensely proud about that. And I'm looking forward to, to seeing the platform. Uh, we have a question in, uh, from you, from Leonardo Linz. Uh, can you tell us about the digital maturity of SMEs in Egypt? Has Egypt already implemented any indicator on AI and how is the result? Thank you for this question, Leonardo. It's uh, actually uh, Egypt succeeded to have in place an AI strategy, which is already started to be implemented and which is focused on building the capacity uh, uh, for in, in the AI uh, perspective. And this include uh, the SMEs building the capacity. It include the, 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 the student in the universities uh, the graduates, there is now a, a different uh, uh, certificate uh, as well as the degrees uh, in, in the artificial intelligence provided by uh, our uh, Egyptian university in collaboration with international universities as well. And part of this capacity building is also devoted to the SMEs in order to really to leverage uh, Their, their, their skill of the AI development uh, in the future. This is in briefly what, what already we, we have done right now concerning this in, in Egypt. Thank you. So th thanks so much again, uh, Nagwa. That, that was all, all really interesting. Um, and now I'd like to turn over to Mark Erbach, who is the head of digital economy metrics at Statistics Canada. Uh, to take the floor and give us an overview of Canada's efforts, which I know there are many, uh, to measure well-being, both domestically as well as internationally, as well as one or two specific and actionable areas in which uh, you really want to see us elaborate the toolkit. Uh, so, Mark, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Molly. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, today to participate in this panel. Uh, with, with such well-regarded colleagues. Obviously, it's always such, an up, such a pleasure to uh, share space with uh, Alexandra, Dominic, uh, yourself, and Nagwa, even if we're still in a virtual space. Uh, it's no secret uh, that both myself and Statistics Canada are big uh, fans of the Going Digital Toolkit and then certainly uh, uh, support its development and have made use of it as, a, um, as an excellent tool. Uh, so I'd like to take a few minutes here to discuss uh, Statistics Canada's efforts to measure digitalization and well-being, uh, which is covered as a broad theme within the Going Digital Toolkit. Uh, this study of the intersection of internet use and individual well-being has been of interest to the agency for many years, uh, but was accelerated about two years ago with uh, work that our agency took on as part of an in-depth review uh, to meet the needs of the Bureau of the Conference of European Statisticians Work Plan, uh, which, which Dominic is a part of, of course. 
Um, the in-depth review identifies uh, key issues that need to be considered when defining and measuring well-being in the digital age, uh, focusing on merging challenges and opportunities for adapting statistical infrastructures in the face of the digital transformation. Uh, a summary of this work is also highlighted in the uh, OECD's Going Digital Toolkit note uh, on the topic of digitalization and well-being. Uh, so to better measure well-being in the digital age, Statistics Canada has taken some specific steps, um, particularly taking advantage of the existing survey of household ICT adoption and use, uh, the Canadian Internet Use Survey, uh, which typically runs on a biennial basis. Uh, first, in 2018, uh, the survey collected information for the first time uh, from individuals on uh, problematic internet use, uh, looking at issues of victimization online, and also the need to take a break from the internet or decrease the time that was spent online due to using it too often or for too long. Uh, these results helped to demonstrate some of the personal challenges of being online and highlighted some potentially negative effects of online activity, whereas we had tended to in the past, always look at really the, the positive effects of, uh, of being online. The ability to break, that, break the data down by socio-demographic characteristics was also a very valuable aspect of this data collection tool. In the 2020 version of the survey, uh, additional content was added in response to the work that was done for the in-depth review. In line with the suggestions made in that document, uh, the ICT uh, uh, household, household adoption and use questionnaire was expanded in conjunction with well-being experts at Statistics Canada to include further questioning on the self-perceived quality, quality of relationships, as well as the frequency of connections with friends and family in a virtual and or a, a physical setting. A new question was also asked on general self-perceived uh, physical health. These questions were designed based on the OECD guidelines on measuring subjective well-being that has been followed in other Statistics Canada work. So although these questions standing on their own are, are not as useful, uh, this additional information asked for the first time in Canada on an individual ICT use survey uh, provides some very interesting opportunities for further data disaggregation and research. It is expected that by co-collecting this information on an ICT survey, as opposed to collecting it on two separate surveys, uh, correlational analysis based on usage of technology and self-reported states of well-being can be undertaken with a large and robust sample. Uh, currently, there is a research team at Statistics Canada, Canada analyzing these results, and we will look forward to seeing the outcomes of their work in the new year. Additionally, uh, new data collection will go ahead in fall 2022 on the same survey and collect similar indicators uh, with the idea of building out uh, a time series for this type of data, uh, which will be particularly interesting uh, in the context of, of the pandemic and the amount of time that people are, are spending online. Of course, any information of this type is very challenging to collect in a survey format, given that data are collected on, an in, on a relatively infrequent basis, and it may be difficult for a respondent to assess how they feel over, over such a prolonged period of time. To address this challenge and then build on the survey work that's been done, innovative and new data collection methods must be considered and a mobile app has recently been launched by Statistics Canada to address this critical data gap on subjective well-being measures. The app um, will enable collection of in-the-moment quantitative data on the activities and well-being of participants, uh, shedding light on the effect of participating in various activities on well-being. Participant, participants will be prompted by the app to respond to questions several times each day over a 30-day period that they are selected to be in the sample. Uh, participants will also be able to adjust the frequency of not notifications that they receive. We're still in the final stages of developing the sampling strategy, uh, but a pilot study will soon be going forward uh, with a sample of 50,000 randomly selected individuals. Uh, 
the app was designed at the same rigorous standards as all of our uh, collection tools at Statistics Canada and had confidentiality and security at top of mind in its design, since we anticipated this to be one of the concerns. Uh, we were anxious to see how we can use this tool to enhance understanding of subjective well being in Canada. And we'll also explore how to better use it to capture information on the intersection of the digital economy and well being. So, I think there are two main takeaways uh, from the work that has been done in this area. Um, the first is that the collection methods uh, for this data emerging data need will need to continue to evolve since traditional surveys alone may not capture all the information required for a full picture of the topic. To this end, I think that national statistics organizations uh, through organizations, organizations such as the OECD and the ITU uh, can collaborate on their methods and share best practices to help close this important data gap. The second of these key, key takeaways from the work is that any indicators will be much more powerful if, like many of the other indicators that we have put together uh, related to the digital economy, uh, they can be standardized and collected in a coherent and internationally comparable manner. Uh, common methodologies, concepts, definitions, and indicators uh, should be agreed upon and shared. And I think to this end, uh, the Going Digital Toolkit is well positioned to provide great value not only as a place for these statistics to be housed, compared, and analyzed, but also to expand on methodological guidance and best practices for the collection of these types of statistics. I would suggest that the toolkit be used not only to expand the indicators in this area, including those on problematic internet use and subjective well being related to the internet, but also as a forum to highlight research that is being done in the area of digitalization and well being uh, using new and innovative approaches to collection and research. So I will leave it there, uh, but thank you again for the opportunity to share today. Thanks so much, Mark. You and your colleagues are always uh, doing so many innovative things in this space. It, it's great to, to hear about that. And I didn't realize you were going to be using an app to, to collect new data. And I'm, uh, I am super looking forward to that. I think that, that that's really interesting. And I couldn't couldn't agree more that we're going to have to think about ways to, to collect, innovative ways to collect data. Uh, that surveys won't do it, I think, is so many of these issues. One, we maybe can't get the data from surveys, and two, it, it's just moving so fast. I was just wondering before um, I, I let other people come in with their own questions, uh, you mentioned collecting data about time spent uh, using different, different tools, and I wondered if you were using that or collecting that data with, with a view to trying to get at uh, internet addiction? Uh, and if so, if you had any, uh, if you've done any work or thought, of, thought, of, thought about that in terms of how much time you would consider to be addiction and how much time uh, is normal. As a mother of three kids, I think about this all the time uh, and just sort of wondered if, if you all had um, thought about this. Sure. Yes, that, that is always a concern in my household as well. Um, no, certainly. Uh, this has been one of the real challenges, I think, of um, just using the uh, survey of the traditional survey approach is that trying to get at um, sort of these ideas of how much time people are spending on the internet. I think it was a much easier question to ask people 10 or 15 years ago than it is today, as everything, it's kind of hard to define when we we're not on the internet. Um, so that's one of the real challenges that we found with using the survey approach. Uh, we do still try to attempt to ask people in terms of hours per week uh, that they uh, that they dedicate to internet activity, um, and we will sort of break that up into buckets of, of intensity of use. Um, Certainly, uh, we ask people to exclude uh, work activity and, and still will have a certain percentage. I think it's uh, just under 10% that are, are still over 40 hours a week uh, being spent online. Uh, so uh, certainly there are some, intent, uh, some intensive users of the internet, uh, but we're, hope we're hopeful that tools such as the app um, 
we do we have used uh, time use surveys in the past to capture this type of information, um, but as other organizations will know as well. Uh, it's a very intensive way for respondents to provide information. Uh, it involves a lot of processing and a lot of respondent burden. Uh, so that's also a very challenging way to do that. So certainly um, we will be continuing to explore new, um, new methods of data collection in that space as well um, to try and uh, avoid that burden through, through, through traditional surveys. Right. Thanks. Thanks again, Mark. Um, and I think we have a, a question from Leonardo. No, from Fabio Sen. Uh, from your experience, how do you see the policy impact of subjective well-being measures? Are there any examples of policymakers uh, using this type of data to design better policies in Canada? Uh, so more specifically in the digital space, um, this is something that we've really just kind of gotten our first cut of data at and are really starting to look at things. So I don't think that um, necessarily our, our policymakers have, have had the, uh, the opportunity to explore that data um, as, as much as, as they probably will in the future. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the ongoing well-being program at Statistics Canada, uh, that's, that's been developed in, in collaboration with policymakers in order to ensure that uh, the data needs that are there are, are being met. Okay, great. We've got one more question before we move to, to Alexandra. Could you talk more about data collection innovation to use? Can these new developments in data collection be implemented in enterprise surveys from Leonardo? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I think with the household internet use survey, um, first maybe I'll just quickly talk about um, the use of the electronic questionnaire itself has really allowed us to expand the um, just the sample size of the survey. Uh, which has allowed for far, far greater um, um, uh, data disaggregation, uh, which has certainly been a, um, a, a, an important topic for us as we try to break data down by age, by income, by gender, um, by, by area of the country. Uh, this has certainly been an issue. Um, and, and I think really on the enterprise side of things, we're, we're receiving the same types of demand for, for more information uh, in terms of size of firm, uh, industry of firm, um, um, firm ownership by gender. Uh, we're being asked for, for all sorts of different uh, breakdowns of, of that type of data as well. So I think, um, Expanding those sample sizes, although, although we don't like to put that response burden on on businesses and, and individuals, that uh, it, it's something that we need to balance out a little bit more. But uh, taking advantage of those tools is certainly important. Um, in using the um, this newly developed app, which actually just launched a couple of weeks ago, so uh, we're we're anxious to see how that's going to go. It's been a project that's been in in the works for quite a while. Um, uh, certainly, we'll see how this go, uh, how how it rolls out, and sort of learn some lessons from that, and then if that can be applied um, to the enterprise side of things as well. I, I guess that will be uh, will remain to be seen. Well, thank thanks again, Mark. Uh, that that was great. Just from my side, I have uh, also heard of some some policymakers using Facebook and Facebook um, sort of. Uh, alerts to try to get uh, responses to, to certain questions too, which which I thought was was quite quite innovative. But now I'd really like to turn to our last, but certainly not our least uh, panelist, Alexandra Barbosa, who's in charge of several nation nationwide Brazilian ICT surveys, as well as being head of the Center of Studies for Information and Communications Technologies. He's also uh, very well known in ITF circles. So Alexandra, the floor is yours to please give us an overview of Brazil's efforts to produce ICT statistics, to measure the societal impacts of digital transformation, as well, again, as your views on one or two specific areas where we can uh, try to make the, the toolkit better and more useful for emerging economies uh, like Brazil. 
So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Molly. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is uh, indeed a great pleasure to be part of this panel with our dear colleagues. Uh, but before I, I go to the, quest, uh, to the answer to your question, let me uh, say that um, I would like to congratulate Dominic for the census in Poland in such a difficult times. And I, I'm saying that because I'm, I'm myself a member of the Brazilian Census uh, Commission and to the, the pandemic first, and then for other issues, we had to postpone the Brazilian census for the second year in a row, but uh, hopefully um, in 2022, we're going to conduct it, but uh, congratulations, Dominic, this is impressive. Well, um, let me start uh, by saying that uh, uh, here in Brazil, we have a tradition introducing uh, public statistics to measure the impact of digital transformation in our country. And I, I would say that um, in general terms, there is a broad consensus among um, stakeholders uh, in Brazil that uh, production of reliable data is fundamental to design uh, effective policies fostering the digital transformation. And in case of Brazil, to reduce existing digital inequalities in the country, which is not a, a good figure. You know, we still have a digital gap, uh, especially in the north of the country and rural areas. Uh, it's improving, but uh, it is still uh, a, an issue. But of course, that this broad consensus gives uh, or provides us the support we need for uh, a regular data production in the country. And we have been producing regular ICT statistics since uh, 2005 in an annual basis, covering um, a wide range of uh, areas such as households, enterprises, government, education, health, and etc. Um, currently, we have 10 surveys, national-wide surveys. Uh, and this is carried out by CETIC at the Brazilian Network Information Center uh, through uh, traditional ICT standalone surveys in compliance with the uh, ERISTAT, OSD standards, ITU, et cetera. And in the scope of this digital transformation, uh, Brazil, like most countries, I guess, is facing an increase in demand for high quality, timely and disaggregated data, as was mentioned by our previous uh, speakers, to support policymaking. And probably it's not necessary to mention that policymakers are increasingly demand more disaggregated data to allow for analysis based on a multiple social demographic variables, such as socioeconomic status, level of education, gender, age, race, disabilities, you name it. Uh, but however, we still have data gaps which may hamper evidence-based policy support in the digital transformation and the digital economy. And this is the case of statistics on new emerging technologies, as has been already said, such as AI, or on new issues uh, such as trust on the online environment. OECD is doing a wonderful uh, debate around this uh, need for establishing frameworks to measure the trust or disinformation or on, poly on privacy uh, and data production. So those are new areas that we still have data gaps. And these new data gaps, um, uh, to, they, they do impose additional efforts to us data producers to find innovative solutions to keep pace with the data requirements by different stakeholders. And this implies in maintaining, of course, um, the, the efforts of, uh, of data production based on our traditional methods, such as uh, survey, census, or admin data, but it also imposes the need of finding new means of adopting different data sources, such as uh, big data sources, or uh, imposing the need to explore new methods or algorithms for combining a variety of data sources to produce quality statistics. This is a, a, an issue for us data producers. And uh, this became even more evident during the pandemic when traditional data collection methods were severely affected. So uh, Molly, uh, to summarize uh, the efforts being made by CETIC in Brazil, I would um, highlight three, three areas. First one, of course, is data production. Uh, as I mentioned, we are carrying um, 
out 10 nationwide ICT standalone surveys, including um, the inclusion of uh, indicators on AI adoption in four areas. We have included uh, AI adoption in our government survey, enterprise surveys, health surveys, and uh, education surveys to see how those um, establishments are adopting AI. And since last year, during the pandemic, we started a new innovative project, uh, project based on a web panel to monitor the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the internet usage. We run four waves of this panel to understand how um, internet use was impacted by the pandemic and the, the impact was really uh, big. Uh, and this panel is now being used as an innovative platform to conduct new uh, surveys. So we are using this panel as a quick response strategy to areas such as data protection and privacy. We are right now running a panel to understand the perception of uh, citizens on the issue of the personal data protection. And we are now, after this panel, we are starting uh, e-waste panel to understand how <clears throat> Brazilians are uh, dealing with this concept of um, uh, e-waste disposal. The second area I would say, which is very dear to us and very important is capacity building. We offer regular capacity building programs uh, and workshops on the use of statistical data for policy making and monitoring. Um, and besides, we as a UNESCO center, we are a UNESCO category two center for Latin American Portuguese speaking countries in Africa. We do uh, give, uh, provide methodological support to these uh, countries in these two regions um, in order to help them to develop their national data collection projects. And last but not least, the importance of data visualization and micro data sharing. We do have a very strong practice in data sharing. Um, well, this is a summary of uh, our efforts. And um, regarding your question on the toolkit, I would say that the same as the previous speakers, the, the uh, OSD Going Digital Toolkit is really wonderful. I have to agree with Dominique and uh, Nagwa and Mark. It is a very nice uh, tool. And I think that uh, it is already a solid and very valuable tool to OSD countries, of course, and to some known OSD countries like Brazil, uh, because it provides really a comprehensive view of key dimensions of the digital transformation, such as connectivity, innovation, productivity and growth, well-being, digital skills. Of course, that's in, within these dimensions, uh, innovation and skills or well-being are more difficult to be measurable uh, in, uh, across uh, countries. Uh, and I, I would say that the digital kit, uh, the toolkit, also allows countries to better assess their state of digital development. And uh, this allows us, us to formulate better policies in response to this assessment. So the toolkit is already effective, I would say, in helping countries in understanding existing policy gaps, uh, as well as areas for improvements and to track their progress towards sustainable economic growth. Um, but I would say that in addition to this, this is already very good, uh, and we have to thank the OSD for this uh, wonderful tool. I would say that as um, we, ob we observe that the digital intensive uh, business and governments engage in a more complex activity in the digital environment, I believe that one actionable area in which OSD could maybe endeavor some effort is in creating a data user community around the data visualization tool, which is very good. Uh, but data community is very important. You know, we do have this practice here in Brazil and this data community that I'm talking about could maybe go beyond policymakers and governments uh, to involve broader, a broader range of data users, such as academic researchers, policymakers, companies, and civil society organizations, um, and as well as data producers, of course. And I think that this type of uh, data community could eventually help identifying new functionalities and make uh, it more used by a broad uh, range of actors. 
So with that, I will stop here, Molly, and thank you again for giving me this opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, and thank you for your uh, words about the toolkit and that really interesting idea for ways we can not just make the toolkit better, which we can, but also how we can get to uh, promote it a little bit more widely, which I think is something that, that we badly need to work on. Uh, you all are very busy at <laughs> 10 national surveys. That, that's an awful lot uh, happening, but it, it all sounds very exciting and, and important. And I, I was really intrigued by this idea of the, the quick response strategy um, and how that's working. And I'll, I'll be interested to see the, the data that you get out and what kind of lessons learned you might have, have gleaned from that because uh, like you, I'm constantly being asked for more data, uh, more disaggregated data, more data on whatever people are interested at the minute, and, and knowing how you, you do that will be great. I also just wanted to, to mention, you, you mentioned you have uh, some questions on AI adoption in, in health, and uh, we do have a health data governance indicator on the toolkit, so I may follow up with you later to see if somehow we, we can find find out if that data is comparable enough that, that we could we could include you. But before I, I turn it over to the floor and everyone please do send in questions in the chat, I wanted to ask you about your work using microdata uh, and its analysis and what kind of insights you've gotten for policymakers. Uh, we do, not me personally, but I do have colleagues that, that do a lot of microdata analysis, and it's turning out some, some really interesting insights, particularly in the productivity space. And I just wondered if you could give us a, a few words about what you're doing and how it's having an impact on, on policy. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you for this question, uh, Molly. It is a, a very important one because for us, uh, uh, Data sharing is something very important. We rely on um, agreements with governments. We are trying with the private sector. It's very tough. It's not easy. Our National Statistical Office um, was uh, able to access uh, mobile data from one mobile operator in Rio only. Uh, but we are trying to make this um, pilot uh, to convince uh, private data source providers uh, to share data. But let me talk about uh, the microdata. The microdata from our, um, from each survey that is conducted by CETIC, of course, is a key product of our process, uh, which is used as an input for data analysis and uh, as well as for longitudinal data analysis and policy evaluation analysis. And in these uh, processes, it often happens to have a specific demands for a special data tabulation for a, spe for a specific domain of analysis, uh, including geographic data and socioeconomic variables. And this is done by using um, tools that we have developed ourselves based on our package to handle the micro databases. And when um, we have uh, a demand from external uh, data users, for instance, a policymakers or an academic researchers is willing to have a specific uh, analysis domain, we promote uh, micro data sharing through data sharing agreements, which includes uh, capacity building for the use of micro data from our surveys that are based on complex sample uh, design. So it's not only providing the, the or sharing the micro database, we have to build capacity uh, so that the data user that is going to use this to have an insight for policy design or whatsoever, they need to take into account the, how the sample was designed. We, we work with a complex sample um, uh, with a stratification. So we have to take into account the sample design in order to uh, handle the micro database. So we do provide capacity building so that uh, uh, the data user using the micro database will not make an, uh, any silly mistake in terms of interpretation and uh, building insights from the, from the data. Basically, this is the, the idea. 
That, that's really great and important. And it's it's awesome that you're doing this capacity building and trying to, to help uh, with the data that you've collected, others do, do important uh, research and analysis. So thank you so much uh, for your time. I think I'd like to try to get some interaction between everybody, including the audience now. And Dominic, I'll ask you first if you have any reactions to any of the panel presentations, and then uh, I'll open, open the floor to others. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Indeed, what, uh, what Alexandra has, has just said, you know, in terms of this capacity building, this is something that we, we tend to call nowadays this data stewardship thing, you know, that uh, we need those who are really capable of, uh, and, you know, facilitating the use and the reuse of data that has been, you know, produced in one place and can be used in the other place. But there there's, has to be someone in between that will kind of like explain what the data is about, how it was designed, how it was, you know, produced in, in, and things like that. Because um, in the avalanche of those sources coming to the ec ecosystem, you know, uh, you might find yourself uh, in trouble in just, just looking for the appropriate data and understanding what it stands for. <clears throat> and of course, uh, within the official statistical system, we had this strong tradition of being transparent, you know, and uh, trying to convey as deeply as, um, as profoundly as possible the methodology of how the data is produced. It, it's, it may not be the case in, in terms of other sources, and as we know all, you know, uh, uh, nowadays we don't have a kind of like a monopoly in terms of producing the data for the information market, <clears throat> uh, but we can facilitate the use of other data sources through uh, even uh, more profound uh, services related to what we produce. Uh, in the, uh, I mean, uh, in an official statistical system to the, uh, to the different layers like standards, classifications, you know, nomenclatures, all these kind of like technological you know, standards that we introduced, we can help others to build on those and to facilitate the use of other sources, you know, through, uh, through an interface or, or catalyzer that we might become uh, uh, playing the role of the data steward. So I, I think that's ex extremely important and that's the challenge for us for the coming days. Thanks so much for that. I, I agree with Vlad and um, I often see people using data in bad ways because they don't understand the sample or how it was collected. And we've tried really hard, at least on the toolkit, to include all these notes and disclaimers and try to really give people a sense of, of what it is. Um, so is there anybody who wants to ask a burning question before, before I have? I have another one, <laughs> but I wanna give folks that are in the audience and haven't had as much chance to talk as me. Uh, to do so, but maybe while we're waiting for that. Um, one issue that I, I mentioned it before that I think is absolutely extremely important is better understanding misinformation, disinformation, and other forms of untruth that circulate online. Um, and in this vein, we've, uh, we recently wrote a, a short paper uh, about it, trying to come up with a typology of different untruths online uh, with a view to uh, defining the terms we're talking about. Often misinformation is uh, confused with disinformation or propaganda or other things. Uh, so most of the literature isn't very robust in this area. So we've tried to come up with these definitions uh, with a view to trying to measure this phenomena. Um, and I just wondered if speakers, participants, anybody on the call today has any experience in this space uh, that they'd like to share, because it's it's something that, that we're kind of in the middle of brainstorming ourselves, and it's extremely complicated and will require non-traditional data collection methods, I'm absolutely certain. But I just wondered if anyone has thoughts on that. Mark? Uh, sure. So I, I can just share a little bit about uh, our experience there with trying to collect some information on misinformation. Uh, this was a, uh, kind of a, a challenging topic that we sort of discussed at OECD and at ITU as well over the past couple of years. But um, 
And we had uh, had made previous attempts at Statistics Canada to uh, capture this through a survey tool and really had a challenge sort of communicating to respondents what we were looking for and really trying to get any type of coherent answer. Um, but one thing that we did find is that during the pandemic, uh, it did provide the opportunity to focus questions on a particular topic of interest. Um, so focusing directly on information related to COVID-19. Uh, in this context, we were able to build much more successful questions and sort of focus uh, the responses um, to this type of information. So I think that was uh, one piece that we picked up is that um, I think in, even focusing it on that topic, I think just asking about mis misinformation online, um, I think we had high 90% uh, said that, of course, they had seen some sort of misinformation online. So to us, that's not overly useful. Um, but I think sort of drilling down, we were able to see some interesting results uh, in terms of um, how people verify information online that they find. Um, I mean, even just briefly, there are some of the quick results that we saw, uh, kind of 40% of Canadians reported that they, they read something online, believed it to be true, and then later went back to realize, oh no, that was something that was inaccurately reported or something that was being spread um, uh, without being uh, fact-checked. Uh, and we also sort of found some interesting results in terms of um, how often people check information that they pull off, uh, pull off online. Uh, and then finally, um, I think one of the things that was uh, a little bit surprising to us uh, was just in terms of how many people actually share information online without really knowing if it's true or not. Um, so over half of Canadians identified that they had done that in the first months of the pandemic, either shared articles with friends, posted it to Twitter uh, without doing any sort of verification themselves. And I think it's just sort of a natural, I think probably all of us have sort of probably gone through that exercise as well, where you sort of um, uh, maybe share something very quickly and then kind of go back to uh, verify the accuracy of that later. So um, just sort of some, some thoughts on measurement there. Uh, it's certainly a very challenging topic uh, to still get at. And I think probably going beyond the survey is necessary, but uh, uh, being able to focus the survey on, on a particular topic we found was was more helpful than our previous efforts in this area. That's really interesting. And I may follow up with you uh, bilaterally on that to, to see exactly the questions you asked um, and focusing on one area I could see would be would be helpful. Um, you know, I I'm just it's so tough because we talked a little bit about this, the team that, that wrote the paper, how do you define truth, right? Some one person's truth isn't somebody else's truth. Uh, it kind of depends on where you sit and your, your background and how, how we do that, I think is gonna be really difficult, but it seems probably pretty clear it's gonna take some kind of um, union or cooperation between people and technology to, to, to try to make that happen. Um, before I go to Alexandra, I did, I think we had our Pitha Disse who had her hand up. I don't know, our Pitha, if you want to come in now for. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Molly. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. I am tuning in from Boston. Um, so, uh, Mark, I think you shared some really interesting insights and the the problem or the challenge with misinformation and disinformation which i have often seen is that um the root cause of the problem is across so many boards especially when the channels of communication have become so complex today and the way we consume information or news is across um these channels so it could be facebook or twitter where things go viral in seconds, or it could be um, a consistent information uh, disorder across, say, WhatsApp, which is private messaging. So um, where disinformation or misinformation stems from becomes really challenging to identify and track. Um, and the whole 
point of intentionally or unintentionally consuming and sharing such information also presents a problem because we don't know um, how things go, how this, this particular piece of information um, went viral and has caused this asymmetry in um, the truth. Um, so it's really difficult to measure these root causes to kind of come up with solutions as to where we might need extra little extra work uh, to be put in and who's going to be putting this work is it the government in kind of educating users to be more um, aware of how they're consuming information and the way to fact check information or is it on is it the responsibility of social media companies who facilitate the sharing of information so um, there are so many uh, pain points and um, measurements which you have to take into consideration when looking at this whole. So um, collecting data in this sense becomes um, near impossible uh, given that there are so many indicators and factors. Uh, so if, if there was a way to kind of figure out what are these data points which we need to identify in order to come up with workable solutions, which go way beyond than just say labeling or fact checking, but as a more systemic change, um, I would love to hear thoughts about that. Well, that that was really helpful and useful, Arpita. Uh, you've generated some some interest here. I've got three people who want to intervene: Alexander, Dominique, and then Fabio. We have one minute, so I'm gonna not close and I'll just say thank you in advance right now, but please, uh, Alexander, give us 30 seconds um, uh, on your take on this. Thank you very much. I do agree with Mark and Arpita. You raised a very important issue on the channels of communication. Social media is uh, where um, this information is happening. Uh, so there is one issue that uh, human moderation is just impossible. So we need to think about a combination of a human and machine type of moderation uh, within artificial intelligence. But uh, in any way, all those moderations type of intervention and policy and regulations may not solve 100% uh, of the problem. The root of the problem is on education, uh, on aware, awareness raising and media information literacy. So um, uh, maybe OSED have to work or develop an agenda to, to build a measurement framework to that. Uh, but we have, government have to invest a lot in education and media information literacy. I will stop here because uh, my third second is gone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dominic. It's just, it's just a small point about, because I took a look at this typology of these uh, disinformation. Uh, I want to play the role of the advocate advocate of the satire. Uh, satire is very positive. It can convey the true of actually more often than the, the, the false. I would call it the other way here. I would call it the uh, uh, mis uh, contextual deficiency, you know, that you lose the context and you might not understand the satire pro pro properly, but then satire as propaganda can, can include for all four of them, you know, misinformation, you know, uh, uh, disinformation, whatever. But uh, uh, but I like that anyway, and I, I think that you know uh, uh, that should be further developed because this is a very nice typology, and we should work on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have no idea how many hours we spent on this, so we but we will we will keep going. Nagra, last word to you. Thank you, Molly, and uh, I fully agree with uh, with what mentioned by my colleague concerning the misinformation, especially when some uh, when it comes to the social from the social media like Facebook and Twitter. But I would like to draw the attention that we shouldn't uh, forget the positive side of this social media when we get some information related to research. Sometimes the student they went to the social media and in order to collect the data for their research or assignment, uh, as well as also the entrepreneur and the small and micro enterprise when they also um, uh, uh, went to this, uh, this uh, mechanism in order to really to test uh, the market or to test their uh, beneficiaries about the product or their service. And again, thank you very much for you, Molly, and uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all today in this uh, workshop. Thanks, and just for my side, a big, big round of applause here for the speakers. You don't get to hear it, but uh, 
lots of you got up really early. You spent lots of time preparing wonderful presentations, and I certainly learned a lot. So thank you so much, and I really hope I get to see you at the IGF next year, if not before that. So take care. Thank you.